Hey, what's up? Tim Cant here. And in this video, we're going to look at a beginner's guide to rave stabs. We're going to kick off with some cultural and technological context. And then we're going to look at how you can make some of these sounds for yourself in various bits of software. Lots of links to the tunes mentioned in the video description. So without further ado, let's get rocking. Rave stabs come in many flavours. For the purposes of this video, we're going to use a broad definition of rave stabs that includes a variety of sounds such as sampled staccato chords, such as this stab from LA Styles' James Brown is Dead. Punchy bass stabs, as heard in Wax Doctors, A New Direction. And legato synth leads such as the Hoover from Human Resources Dominator. These sort of sounds have a variety of sources. Some rave stabs might come straight out of a synth, some are sampled synths, and some are samples from records made with real instruments. What these disparate sounds have in common is that they all use digital music making technology in some form, be it digital sampling in the case of James Brown is Dead, digital synthesis in the case of A New Direction, or hybrid digital analog synthesis in the case of Dominator. This is why we only started to hear these kinds of sounds appearing during the 80s and 90s, when digital hardware began to enter the mainstream. Until the late 1970s, music production was an almost entirely analogue process. The closest thing to a sampler was the Mellotron, a keyboard which used tape loops to play back recordings of acoustic instruments. The result is an uncanny approximation of an acoustic sound with a dreamlike quality, and you can hear the Mellotron in effect making the flute sound at the start of the Beatles' Strawberry Fields Forever. During the late 20th century, improvements in integrated circuit technology resulted in more affordable and powerful microchips or silicon chips. And in 1979, the world's first digital audio workstation, the Fairlight CMI, or Computer Musical Instrument, made its debut. It cost an enormous amount of money, especially for 1979, between £18,000 and £60,000, depending on which model, but it offered the ability to record, manipulate and sequence audio digitally. The CMI was the progenitor of the computer-based DAWs most of us use today. As you'd hope for such an expensive piece of equipment, the CMI included a library of preset sounds, including a patch known variously as AUK5 and AUK2. This is the original orchestral hit, and it features a snippet of Stravinsky's The Firebird Suite, where the whole orchestra plays a big, frequency-filling staccato chord. According to the Vox video, the sound that connects Stravinsky to Bruno Mars, this hit is taken from this recording. Let's take a listen to a vinyl reissue of that record. Here I've applied some processing to my sample to get a more lo-fi sound like the CMI. Let's compare it with the AUK2 patch from Arturia's plugin recreation, CMIV. I think we can say that this particular recording is indeed the source of the Fairlight Stab. So I would argue that by several metrics this is the OG Rave Stab. It was composed in 1919, recorded in 1965 and sampled in or before 1979. It can be heard on early rave tracks such as Jazz and the Brothers Grimm featuring Baby D and MC Juice's Casanova The Raising Hell Mix from 1989. Here's the patch courtesy of Arturia's contemporary plugin recreation, CMIV. We can play this sound chromatically, that is up and down the keyboard, but most early adopters of this sound played it at a single pitch as an accent rather than as a melody or chord progression. An early use of the patch could be heard on Africa Bambata and the Soul Sonic Forces' Planet Rock. Other Sonic futurists who employed the patch include Kate Bush on The Dreaming and Freeze on IOU. All three of these tracks were released in 1982, and the sound of sampling had become a part of the cultural zeitgeist, with many other manufacturers of digital music technology including similar sounds in their hardware over the following decades. Incidentally, the CMI orchestral stab is possibly one of the first cases of digital sampling infringing on copyright. Certainly, the records made with the CMI weren't endorsed by Stravinsky. So, as with Jungle Breakbeats, using bits of someone else's music is very much a part of Rave Stab's DNA. 
A big part of what made rave music possible was the increased affordability and availability of electronic music making hardware. During the 80s, electronics became increasingly affordable. Relatively cheap and cheerful analog synths such as the Roland TB303 and SH101 could be picked up for a few hundred pounds new in the early 80s, and became even cheaper when they swiftly went out of fashion thanks to a new wave of digital synths. In 1983, Roland's rivals Yamaha launched their hugely successful DX7. It was many times the price of the SH101, but it had an ace up its sleeve. It was a digital synth capable of both frequency modulation FM, and additive synthesis, and it could make acoustic instrument sounds that were light years ahead of the competition in terms of how realistic they sounded. For many musicians, analog synths became obsolete overnight. However, FM synth supremacy was short-lived. In 1987, Roland struck back with their D50, a sample-based instrument that was capable of much more convincing impressions of acoustic instruments, plus a wealth of other sounds including analogue synth-style patches that were more polished and involved than one could hope to get from an analogue synth. The game had changed again, but the D50 itself would be quickly toppled by the legendary Korg M1. Unlike the D50, which supplemented its sampled waveforms with synthesis, 1988's M1 was entirely sample-based and featured a selection of truly timeless patches that have had enduring popularity since the synth's release. Sample-based instruments were here to stay, and around this time samplers were becoming more affordable too, with units such as the Akai S1000 featuring CD quality 44.1 kHz 16-bit sampling, which was astounding for the time. Cheaper samplers were available too, and at the lower end of digital music production, the Commodore Amiga offered four channels of 8-bit audio playback. In the early 90s, you could acquire a Commodore A500, a Technosound Turbo audio interface, and a tracker to sampler sequence set of thing off a magazine cover disc for much less than the price of a hardware sampler. As mentioned, a side effect of all this relatively affordable and futuristic sounding digital kit meant that analog also ran such as the Roland TR808 and TR909 drum machines tumbled in price. The stage was set for an electronic music revolution. The increasing accessibility of music technology in the late 80s and early 90s coincided with an exciting time in dance music, which saw a wealth of new cross-pollinating genres such as Chicago House, Detroit Techno, Bleep, Hip Hop, Dancehall, Belgian Techno, Italo House, Ambient House, Baggy and more. Post-1988 Acid House Summer of Love, these genres began to coalesce into a genre that took the biggest and baddest elements from each of them, Hardcore Rave. To make hardcore, you didn't need a studio, the ability to play an instrument, or even an understanding of music theory. All you needed was a sampler, a sequencer, some records or CDs to sample, and the desire to make some noise. Some of hardcore's most enduring anthems, such as Mannix, Feel Real Good, Two Bad Mice, Hold It Down, and Asen, Close Your Eyes, are essentially collages of other records recontextualized into a new high energy format designed with pure dance ability in mind. Sampling had already been pioneered by hip-hop producers, and a popular hip-hop technique heard in tracks such as Boogie Down Productions' South Bronx would be to sample a staccato funk brass chord or stab. <laughs> hip-hop brass stabs would typically be played at just a single pitch, much like early uses of the CMI orchestral hit. Rave and techno producers began to take synth chords and play them back chromatically. This allowed them to quickly create a big sound, and if you're a DJ, you likely already had multiple 12s that you could source suitable synth chords from. An early example of this is Kevin Saunderson sampling Nitro Deluxe's Let's Get Brutal for Inner City's Big Fun. You can hear famous examples of big rave stabs in tracks such as Outlander's Belgian techno stomper Vamp, which samples Landlord's housey, I Like It, blowout dub, and Too Bad Mice's hardcore breakbeat anthem Bomb Scare, which samples Neon's breakbeat house track Don't Mess With This Beat instrumental. <laughs> UK's hardcore rave scene took particular inspiration from Belgian techno labels such as R&S. Many Belgian techno tunes such as Jesse Deep's Shum, 
Spectrum's Brazil and second phase's Mentasm were sampled prolifically, and you'll likely recognise many of these sounds even if you haven't heard the original tracks before. Post hardcore rave, these sounds continue to be used in genres such as drum and bass, happy hardcore, hardcore techno, hard house, new school breaks, and garage. Rave musicians didn't just limit themselves to sampling tracks in their own or adjacent genres, and stab samples could come from a wide variety of sources. The digital editing capabilities of sampling hardware made it possible for producers to very tightly edit the start and end points of a sample, getting an aggressive sound with a snappy attack. Most music. Producers found this technique and other sample processing tricks worked well on their own synth sounds too. In a 1992 interview with Future Music magazine, the prodigy's Liam Howlett mentions discussing Roland Alpha Gino Hoover sampling with Joey Beltram, the producer of Mentasm. This technique of processing a sample or synth sound, then recording the processed version as a new sound, became known as resampling. Much like Jungle Breakbeats, stabs would get sampled by producers to make a record, then that record would get sampled by other producers. Each generation of sampling would alter the character of the stab, often giving it a grittier quality. Here are the three different versions of the stab tuned to the same pitch, so you can better hear the textural differences introduced by each generation of sampling and processing. Sometimes elements would be added that can be heard in later tracks, such as the pad used by Shades of Rhythm to complement the Patti LaBelle vocal that can be heard on the later Blame track. Here they are tuned to the same pitch. Because of their often synthetic origins, it can be tricky to work out where particular rave stabs actually originate from. So where the stab has an easily attributable source like the Patti LaBelle vocal, it's much easier to be definitive. Working out where synthetic rave stabs come from can be a lot trickier, though there are a lot of resources online discussing potential stab sample sources and attempting to recreate stabs. In the case of the actual source of the Brazil stab, the Ravy Stabs video creating the Spectrum Brazil Rave Stab on an XB30 seems to be close at the very least. Big up Ravy Stabs. There are many ways to acquire Rave Stabs. If you're after authenticity, then you can sample from vinyl and the character of the results will be affected by the state of the record you're sampling from, the turntable and mixer you use, and what you sample into. Sampling from CD will get you a clean sound and modern operating systems allow you to drag and drop audio files directly from CD onto your desktop. Some classic sample CDs from back in the day feature familiar rave stabs. However, while I find vintage sample CDs to be a good source of breaks, I don't tend to use them for stabs as they usually feature quite limited selections. Even the legendary 0G data files volume 1 to 3 aren't a particularly good source of rave stabs, so instead I recommend the excellent, convenient and free Rave Generator 2 plugin, and I've included a link to this in the description. I recommend Rave Generator 2 to everyone from beginners to veterans, and if you're itching to get cracking, it's a great place to start. The samples in Rave Generator 2 aren't pre-tuned, so you'll have to tune them yourself, just as you'd have had to back in the day. Rave stabs are often chordal, and if you're inexperienced, you might find it hard to work out the correct tuning. I recommend the awesome free Blue Lab Audio Chroma for pitch analyzing audio, and this plugin will show you not only what notes are present in the audio signal, but also how close to concert pitch they are.
You can find a link to this plugin in the video description. You can sample rave stabs from lossy files. I feel like this is a less egregious sin than sampling breaks from a lossy format, but I still try not to make a habit of it. If you're a real degenerate, you can even sample stabs from YouTube videos, but I personally would avoid this route if at all possible. Another solution is to make your own stabs with real or virtual synths, and in the following chapters we'll look at how to recreate various stab sounds in virtual instruments with varying degrees of accuracy. The stab from Landlord I Like It Blowout Dub was ubiquitous in the early days of hardcore, and you can hear on tracks such as SL2's DJ's Take Control, Alternate's Evaporate, and DJ Seduction's Hardcore Heaven. In the Gearspace thread, I think I found the real origin of the Landlord stab, user Mr. Veraldo details his theory that the source of the Landlord stab is a Clavinet Ensemble preset from the Yamaha DX7. Specifically, it's the Clav Ons patch from the US version of the synth that can be found on ROM 3A. I put a link to a page where you can download the DX7 ROMs in the description. We can load these ROMs into a compatible FM synth, such as Dext or FM8. If we load the Clava Ons patch up and play a single note, we get a harmonically rich sound. The patch is based around two voiced operators, each modulated by two unvoiced operators. Let's hear how they sound individually. To me, this doesn't sound much like the Landlord stab when played monophonically, but if we sequence a minor chord with a velocity of 80 with an extra root note on the two octaves below, the sound starts to take shape. Let's add some sample rate reduction with D16 Group Decimal 2, which will emulate the sound of an old school hardware sampler. Now I resample the stab by loading it into a sampler, and use a touch of 12dB low pass filter envelope to shape the sound. I turn up the amplitude envelope attack to soften the start of the sound. To get close to the effects on the original Landlord record, I apply some compression, EQ, chorus, delay and reverb. On the Landlord record, it sounds like the clav sound is led with a synth bass, so I use Serum to make a square oscillator bass patch with a rapidly closing low pass filter to play the same MIDI as the sampled chord. We could use a lo-fi tape emulation to get closer to the late 80s sound of the record, but what I think is more interesting is experimenting with the original chord. For example, we can change the minor landlord stab into a major stab, resample it, and now the original riff has a happy hardcore feel. Let's try a variation on the minor chord. Originally we used a velocity of 80, but what if we were to use a higher velocity level for a more harmonically rich sound? This gives us a more aggressive tone, and we can sculpt the sound further by adjusting the sampler's filter settings. Many rave tracks use synths with detuned saw oscillators to create rich lead sounds. You can hear these kinds of sounds in Terrorizes, It's Just a Feeling, Asen's Close Your Eyes Triple X Mix, and Bizarre Inc's Plutonic. You can make a version of this sound in practically any virtual analog synth. For my version, I'm going to use Arturia Mini V to get an authentic old school analog feel. It even comes with a preset that's exactly the sound we're looking for Saw Detune. This is just two sawtooth oscillators slightly detuned. I sequence a long note on C1 and bounce it to audio. I then load this into a sampler, then loop it, and set it to a single voice so that it can only be played monophonically. I add a saturation effect to rough up the sound a bit and make it feel a bit more upfront, and I like to use a band notch filter on this sound which I feel gives it a bit of a sinister quality. You 
You could modulate this to get that old school era articulation. <laughs> You can add another dimension to the sound's movement by adding a phaser effect. Glide or portamento will give you a snaking feel that you might enjoy. Automating a parametric EQ can also give the sound a touch of a vocal quality. Roland's hybrid digital analog Alpha Juno synth features a preset that fans of rave music will recognise instantly. What the? This kind of sound has become known as a hoover, and as we've already mentioned, it's the defining sound of rave classics such as Human Resources' Dominator, and the same or at least very similar sounds could be heard in Second Phase's Mentasm and Jesse Deep's Shum. This preset was created for the Alpha Geno 1's 1986 launch by legendary sound designer and Spectrasonics founder Eric Persing. I asked Eric about the sound in an interview I conducted for Computer Music Magazine, and he told me that the over-the-top noise was created as a quote-unquote joke. Little did Persing realise that this humorous novelty would become an iconic part of electronic music culture. The key to the what the patch is something that only the Alpha Juno and a few other synths can do, saw width modulation. Yuhi's Diva does a cool impersonation of the Alpha Geno oscillator, but to make this sound, I'm going to use a dedicated Alpha Geno emulation, Audio Realism's Redominator. Redominator has a built in Hoover patch called Kiss Myself, but I'm not a fan of the velocity sensitivity assignment in this patch, and I've got my own take on it that I'm going to run you through because we can make a couple of other sounds as part of the process. First, we initialize the patch. Then we set the saw oscillator to 3, which is the mode that features width modulation. We can hear the width modulation if we turn the pulse width modulation amount up. Let's set the PWM to 127 and the PWM rate to 98. Let's bring the pulse oscillator in too, set it to 3, which also puts it in width modulation mode. Next we're going to add the sub, so set the sub level in the DCO panel to 3 and set the sub to shape 5. Now we activate the chorus. Turn the chorus on and set its level to 83. Now we have a rich hoover sound that really came into vogue in the era of stompy happy hardcore and could be heard on tracks such as Force and the Evolution's Simply Electric. We want this sound to be monophonic, so turn polymode off. Turn porter mode on so the overlapping notes glide between each other. You can control how long the notes take to glide with the porter time fader. This gives us a sound much like the lead noise in Agent Orange's Sounds a Bit Flaky Jungle Mix. To get the hoover feel, we need to add some pitch modulation. First, let's set the envelope. Set L1 to 50, T2 to 50, L2 to 127, T3 to 62, and L3 to 50. In the pitch panel, turn the env up to 127. Now the patch's pitch will follow the envelope we've created. You can get some great effects playing this sound legato and, for example, switching between octaves. This patch is pretty wild, and as mentioned earlier, producers such as Joey Beltram resampled it and applied further manipulation in their samplers, so this is a great jumping off point for experimentation. You can hear a specific housey organ patch in Psychotropic Hypnosis, Enjoy Malfunction, and Neon Don't Mess With This Beat Instrumental slash Too Bad Mice Bomb Scare. This patch is the Elec Organ Patch from the Casio CZ101 Digital Phase Distortion Synth. We can recreate this sound in software using Arturia's CZV. 
in the KVR audio thread Arturia CZV preset collection converted, possible from hardware, posted by Kane123, another user known as Breakmixer posted a converted preset bank from the Casio CZ101. This features the Elec organ patch, which is instantly recognisable as the hypnosis stab. There are three elements of this sound that give it its character, timbre, attack and vibrato. Let's reverse engineer the patch to see how it all works. I'll start with the default template. Phase distortion works by adding harmonics to a sine wave, which is basically the opposite of subtractive virtual analog synthesis, where you use filters to remove harmonics. As I turn up the DCW, or digitally controlled wave parameter, the sine morphs into a sawtooth. The CZV has two waveform selectors for each oscillator, or line as they're known in the synth. These control the shape of the first cycle of the waveform and the shape of the second cycle of the waveform. I set the first waveform to double sine and the second waveform to pulse. I duplicate this line onto the second line and turn up the octave detune to two. This gives us the basic organ sound, and we have that timbre we're looking for. The Elec organ patch has a bit of punch at the start of the sound, and this is achieved by quickly modulating the DCW value. This gives us a little burst of harmonics at the beginning of the sound. This is the attack we wanted. The final touch is some vibrato. I turn up the vibrato depth to around the mid-twenties. This recreates the straight up preset as heard in Hypnosis with its organ style timbre, harmonic attack and expressive vibrato. The neon slash too bad mice version of the stab sounds as if it features another component which I haven't been able to identify. If you have any idea what it might be, please let us know in the comments. Some rave tracks feature sounds that combine the punchiness of a stab with the low end weight of a bass. Tracks that I'd include in this category include Hypron Experience, Lord of the Null Lines, Foul Play Remix, Andy C, Something New Part 2, and Wax Doctor, A New Direction. The Lord of the Null Lines bass sound is straightforward to make, and you can use any virtual analog synth to make it. All we need to do is set up a square oscillator and have a resonant 24 dB filter close over it. In syrup, start by setting an oscillator to a square shape and turn the random phase down. Activate the filter and set it to MG Low 24. Activate filter key following and turn the resonance up to 59%, which will help emphasize the movement when we start to modulate the filter cutoff frequency. Turn the filter cutoff frequency down to 109Hz, then route envelope 2 to the cutoff. Set the modulation amount to 37. Turn envelope 2 sustain all the way down. Now drag up on the decay curve to make it shallower. We can turn this sound into something akin to the something new part 2 bass using unison detune on the oscillator. Set the number of unison voices to 4 and turn the random phase all the way back up. Due to the panned unison voices this sound is quite wide so I suggest using a width reducing plugin such as Ableton Live's Utility. As for the A New Direction bass, I struggled to recreate this in software. There's something about the resonance of the sound that I couldn't get quite right, either with virtual analog or FM synthesis. So I sought help from jungle techno legend Ron Wells, aka Basement Records' Jack Smooth, who handled production and mixing duties on the record. He told me something that I should have guessed. The bass sound on A New Direction was created using the wave shaping functions on the Korg O1W, a machine used on countless classic Jack Smooth productions. The O1W has unique wave shaping capabilities that thus far haven't been recreated in software, so here's hoping that Korg will bless us with a software-based version of this amazing synth at some point. 
In the absence of a virtual O1W, let's check out a couple of variations on this sound that don't use wave shaping, but still get vaguely close to the A New Direction sound. The first version uses the rather cool and free PG-8X plugin by Martin Luders, a virtual analog synth based on the Roland JX-8P. Set oscillator 1 to the square shape, then in the filter panel set the VCF frequency to 28 and the VCF resonance to 54. Now turn up the key follow to full and the OMV to 53. Set envelope 1 sustain to 53. Now return to the VCF panel and change the VCF dynamics mode to 2. Add a touch of delay sync to 2 16th notes and some reverb and you've got something that comes close to the new direction sound. I feel the new direction sound is a little more FM-like, so let's try using FM to see what we can come up with. I'm going to use Native Instruments FM8, but we can get a similar sound in practically any FM synth. Activate Operator E and set its ratio to 4. Route it to Operator F with a value of 55. Turn down Operator E's Decay and Sustain and you get that characteristic reduction in the higher harmonics over a short period, giving us a techy bass tone. We can add a subtle resonance style effect by using Operator E to modulate itself. For more bass we can activate another oscillator and route it directly out to give us a weighty sign sub. This sound is a little clicky at the end, so in the easy panel turn up the amplitude envelope release a touch. Again, not quite perfect, but more convenient than using O1W. Well, that was an obscene amount of hardcore noise. Thank you so much for watching. If you've enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe. And hey, if you want to work out whether I'm chatting a load of nonsense or not, why don't you check out the various links to my tunes in the video description. Apart from that, we're done, so I'll see you later.